Please welcome to the stage, Professor Celeste Montoya. So it may come as no surprise to you, in fact, we just talked about it, that party polarization in the US as a, is at an all-time high. A March 2022 study by the Pew Research Center found that Republicans and Democrats in Congress are further apart ideologically today than at any time in the past 50 years. However, the contemporary patterns of polarization have roots that extend back to that time period and beyond. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little about how a key part of this polarization has had to do with how parties have chosen to address the issues of race and gender made salient by the social movements of that time and in the current moment. But first, a little bit of a context and a civics reminder of, of democracy. So democracy, as you all know, is a system of governance by the people. Most contemporary democracies are representative democracies, elect public officials to represent them. Elections, thus, are an important part of accountability. Parties play an organizing role in this system. Given the diverse array of experience and interests, and an election two parties, the national party structures help to form coalitions in the electorate, so they can win elections, and in the institutions, so that they can pass legislation, some of the time. Social movements are also an important part of democracy. When they are being represented by those in office, they can mobilize outside of institutions in an effort to get their voices heard. Social movements have played an important role in our democracy, both in terms of who gets to participate, as well as efforts to make sure that they're Expanding the right to vote women and to people of color took concerted mobilization. Parties played an important role in this, and in a way that's a little bit different than the current partisan positions. The Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, as it is still sometimes referred to today, established the post-Civil War amendments that gave African Americans full formal citizenship, including the right to vote. The mostly Southern Democrats at that time opposed these efforts and afterwards established the Jim Crow laws that continued discrimination for several decades afterwards. Perhaps not surprisingly, many African Americans in the late 1800s and early 1900s were Republicans. This started to change with the FDR's New Deal after the Great Depression with policies that were meant to address income inequality. But it didn't entirely change um, or cause a realignment because some and many, in fact, of the New Deal policies included discriminatory practices such as redlining. Republicans were also initially more supportive of giving women the right to vote. And in putting ERA, they were the first to put the Equal Rights Amendment um, onto their party platforms. Although eventually the 19th Amendment ended up passing with bipartisan support, and both parties made an effort to appeal to the women who were entering the electorate. For the first half of the 1900s, neither party did a particularly good job of addressing racial or gendered concerns. It took the social movements of the 1960s to get issues of racial and gender equality back on the political agenda. Most of the social movement organizing prior had been the labor movement, and relatedly, class was one of the most salient issues that were caused the partisan divide. Initially, both national parties started to respond to the demands of the social movements, both pro providing support for civil rights and for women's rights. However, as is often the case with social movements that, for, um, that challenge traditional gender hierarchies or hierarchies in general, they also provoked backlash and counter-mobilization. Here, parties start to make, started to make strategic decisions about which side they were going to go with, where they might have the electoral advantage. 
So as the National Democratic Party started to take a more proactive position on civil rights and on women's rights, the Republicans saw an opportunity to break the Democratic stronghold over the South. In the 1970s, you start to see both parties putting issues of gender and race on their party platforms um, where previously there had been none. But they start to do it in different ways. For race, we see the Democrats talking more um, in terms of feminists and women's rights. And for Republicans, we start hearing more traditional gender values um, and traditional familial roles being played. We start seeing differences also in terms of how they approach racial, um, racial issues um, and civil rights. Here we see the Republicans taking a more socially conservative position, but with different justifications, appealing to a new coalition they were building. To libertarians, this framing was about states' rights, about the role of small government, about being economically conservative. There were also Republicans that were more actively and implicitly, um, explicitly socially conservative on both gender and race. With the rise of the religious right in the 1980s, social conservatives start taking a more predominant role in the coalition. You can start to see some significant differences in the parties. Um, in their platforms during that time period. You also start to see differences in par the party and the electorate. So not just looking at what was written on the platform, but how people are responding to that. In the 1980s, we see the gender gap emerging. Now we hear it referred to more commonly in a lot of elections, but really the modern gender gap appears in 1980s. Prior to that, there was a traditional gender gap in which women were more likely to be socially conservative and to vote uh, more in favor of Republicans. But we see that starting to switch. Whoops, whoops, wrong button. <laughs> we see that starting to switch right there around 1984. And at that time, we see a more consistent gap emerging, although it kind of diff differs. You can see a little bit more fluctuation in terms of how the men are voting during that time period. There is also a significant racial gap. And in fact, that racial gap is significantly bigger than we see in terms of the gender gap. And you can see some of the big differences between um, what, how white voters are voting, and this is support for the Democratic candidate, um, and how black, Latino, and Asian Americans are voting. And so they only start kind of collecting some of that data for Asian Americans more recently. One of the things that's really interesting and a little bit beyond the scope of the discussion in my presentation, but we can address in the Q&A, is the fact that if you look at it intersectionally, intersectionally, when you start to look at how race plays a role um, within the gender gap, we see that the modern gender gap is actually driven more by race than it is per se by gender, with white women tending to vote a little bit more, conser well, more conservatively than we see Latinas and African American women. Part of the reason we see the modern gender gap emerging is that both of those groups start to participate in higher numbers after the Civil Rights, after the Voting Rights Act is passed in 1964, first um, giving African Americans more access to the ballot, and later again with its renewal in the 1970s, which emphasized more Latino um, rights. So now we get to the current political moment. In the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen some important mass mobilizations attempting to put some important issues back on the table when people felt the parties were failing to respond to them. The immigrants' rights movement started in the 2005, around 2005 um, as Congress failed to pass meaningful legislation about immigration reform. Occupy Wall Street put class politics back on the table as income inequality began to grow. The Black Lives Movement, Matter Movement started um, discussing a lingering uh, racial inequality. The Me Too Movement and the Women's March put issues of gender violence that remain persistent back on the table. There's also marriage equality and trans rights. There has also been mobilization in the opposite direction of that. Um, and that's important to remember too. We have some pictures up here of the anti-critical race movement, the anti-trans movement as well. And it may look now, as we have these issues that are made salient again, that the parties are doubling down on the same positions they took in the last wave of mobilization. However, I would argue that it's a lot more than that. 
And we see internal conflict within both of these parties about how they're going to address the issues, to what extent they're going to address the issues, what strategies they're going to take. Complicating the matter is shifting demographic, demographics and partisan affiliations. Are more racially diverse. They're also more diverse in terms of gender identity and sexuality and they're less likely to affiliate with either party. So there are part of party trends that, that people were leaving the Republican Party in terms of affiliation first, but that pattern is now following for the Democratic Party as well. This has been putting pressure on both parties to mobilize, cases demobilize the population. One of the things we're gonna to touch on a little bit today and can talk about more in the Q&A are the efforts we see across states with some states working to increase of more people, um, get more people to the polls, and some states passing more restrictive legislation in an effort to demobilize populations. We're at a pivotal point in our democracy, and what happens next is not yet written in stone. And that we're still allowed to talk about some of these issues here at CU Boulder, a right we shouldn't take for granted in places where it is being outlawed elsewhere, makes it all the more important that we do. Thank you.